1997, I had the chance to, to run for state representative. My state representative left. Ironically, my state re representative's name is Jim Brett, who ran for mayor 20 years ago. And when he left, I ran for his seat. And I was fortunate enough to win his seat. And for 16 years, I've had the pleasure of working on Beacon Hill um, and representing the people of Georgetown. I've got a chance to work on a whole host of issues that have prepared me to be mayor of the city of Boston. Uh, worked, when I first got elected, we had a great economy. And in that great economy, we were able to lower taxes 44 times. And we were able to fund a lot of programs and do a lot of infrastructure work in my district around MBTA stations and things like that. Uh, and then 9-11 happened. And, and then the economy went down. And, and after that point, I had to raise taxes. And we, I, I was part of raising uh, taxes to, to, to make up for programs that were being cut, being decimated because of a bad economy, because of a bad budget. <coughs> I don't say that because some of you are saying, well, he raised taxes, I don't want to vote for the mayor. I'm saying that because you have to make tough decisions as a leader. And as mayor of the city of Boston, there are times where you have to make tough decisions on budgets. And when do you cut programs and what programs do you cut? And I've had to do that as a legislator. I've worked on putting 17 budgets together out of Beacon Hill and my colleagues. Some of the, those budgets have been great. Some of those budgets have been very difficult. Uh, but, but I have that experience. I've also on Beacon Hill worked on issues around housing legislation regarding housing, uh, legislation regarding education. In 2010, uh, I voted for a piece of legislation, Education Reform Act, that, that allowed us to deal with the underperforming schools in Boston, level four schools, an agreement that couldn't be made uh, with, the, with the teachers union and the administration. Uh, and it, I had to take some votes that we could change some of the rules in some of the underperforming schools. Um, and the reason why I say that, the kids come first in that case. It was important to do that. And we've turned those schools around. Two of the schools went from a level five to a level one for Orchard Gardens and the trial. Those are some of the changes we're able to make. You, by the way, have a fabulous school down here in the Elliott. One of the first schools, actually, it's the first school I visited as uh, a candidate for mayor of Boston. And when I went into that school, I had a chance to see what happens when you have life in a school, when you see teachers that are happy, principals that understand teachers to be happy and work with the teachers, and a parent base that works together. You can see truly how a school turns around. You can also see over the course of five years, 22 less bus trips to that school. And that school, you know, is, is happening. A lot of folks that didn't have faith in that school years ago, had it years ago, had faith in it, lost faith, and now has faith back in the school. We need to do that in every single neighborhood in this city, not just one neighborhood. And, and I had a chance to visit the other school I went visited not too far from here, the Harvard Kent. And over at the Harvard Kent, it's a level three school. But you know what's in that school? You have a principal that's dedicated and committed. You have teachers that, that love the school, and you have a parent group that, that is involved. We need to make sure that we take the energy that's in the alley, help the Harvard Kent, and now all of a sudden the Harvard Kent becomes, becomes one, of, one of the turnaround schools. So as, as a state representative, I've been able to vote on issues to, to make some of those changes. I've also voted on issues around around grants and Shannon grants and different programs like that, um, around economic development uh, and, and bringing, bringing the film industry here to Boston uh, an industry that most people don't think of, but it brings money and, and tourism to some degree here. And I know we'll talk about that in a minute, because the North End is a neighborhood that gets bamboozled with tourism as far as Hanover <laughs> Street. I don't think it's even the right word, but I know. I know I've been down the North End certainly enough in my campaign, and prior to my campaign, uh, to, to understand the challenge you have. So I have that record on Beacon Hill to be able to work and, and, and try and move an agenda forward. One thing that we try to do on Beacon Hill is compromise. And sometimes you get a piece of legislation that, that might be not perfect or might be perfect in somebody's eyes. And we work together, and the legislation very rarely comes out the way it started. But it's compromised. And sitting down with conservatives and progressives and liberals and Republicans and Democrats, they come up with ways of trying to come up with some compromise. And that's how I, how I view government should be, and that's how I view city government should be. As mayor of the city of Boston, I sat on my campaign four, four and a half months ago. And we've been running all over the city of Boston. And I had a very good day uh, two weeks ago, two, two weeks ago tomorrow. Uh, I came in first place, and the poll said uh, all the way up, I was either in fourth place, third place, second place. I was never in first place in the poll. And that's a good sign, because the poll came out today, and they didn't have me in first place again. And I went in <laughs> second place. And I want to stay in second place until November 5th, and I'll jump into first place. But, you know, in the race, what I've had a chance to do is go around the city. I'm a state representative. I've never run a city line before. I certainly know the, the issues of the city, but I don't, I don't fully understand the different intricacies of different neighborhoods. And I've learned that on this campaign show, going into different neighborhoods and, and understanding the concerns that people have and how different neighborhoods can be, you know, how different in more than one or two or three ways. 
So I've had the chance to, to do that. And we have plans on, on my webpage, mightywalsh.org. We've unveiled most of our plans on how we want to move the city forward. And I'm just going to tell you a few of those, and then I'm going to stop talking and take some questions. Uh, one of those is around education. Today we unveiled the plan for education for high school. But on our webpage, we talk about, we talk about pre-kindergarten and the need to make sure that we have pre-kindergarten slots for every kid in the city of Boston, not just 4,000. And we talk about the ideas of using different buildings if we don't have the school space to do it, using libraries and using all the municipal buildings to be able to get every single kid the ability to get a, an education pre-K and get them into the mainstream of first, second, third grade. That's important in our city. We have to get our kids educated early. We have a plan to talk about making sure when third graders graduate, well, not graduate, but leave the third grade into the fourth grade, they're reading at a third grade level. The history has been we push them along in the system. We push our kids along so they don't have the opportunity to, to they fall behind their very early age, they never catch up. We have a plan to make sure that we keep our kids making sure that third graders are reading at third grade level and mathematics. So when they go to fourth grade, they're keeping the system moving forward. We're talking about our middle schools and how do we improve our middle school. In some cases, we might need to extend the day. In other cases, we need to extend programming. The challenges in neighborhoods are different. The challenges in our kids are different. No one, no two schools in Boston will be the same. When I grew up, same, I was the same artist. Every same school is the same. Public schools, they're all the same. The learning is the same. Learning is different today. So we're talking about how do we improve the education and how do we allow kids the opportunity to learn so that we're not pushing them through the system. Today, I, I, I unveiled a plan on high schoolers. You know, 16% of our ninth graders that go to the side this year are going to drop out of high school. We have a huge gap with our African American students and Latino students. There, they, there is a, a wide gap there. And how do we try and keep our kids in school so they don't quit school, and they don't become part of a statistic on the street as far as a dropout, potentially involved in gang activity, potentially involved in drug and alcohol addiction? You know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter where, what neighborhood it is, we need to keep our kids in school. So what we're talking about doing is having a ninth grade individual plan for our kids to make sure that every kid has a counselor in school so we can help them with their challenges as they move forward to, throughout the school system. We need to improve our math, math skills and our reading skills. 51% of the kids that are in ninth grade underperform on MCAS. Now MCAS is not the only benchmark we want to use, but what we do is we push our kids through the system. At some point they drop out. So in ninth grade we want to put that individual plan around each kid. In 10th grade, you want to continue that plan. If kids aren't reading at a proficient level by 10th grade, we're not putting them into 11th grade. We want to keep them in 10th grade and make sure that they get up to par. Because when they get to 11th and 12th grade, we're going to introduce something new in their life that's not here today, career academies. We're going to allow them the opportunity to, while they're in school, to get into a VOTEC program <coughs> or into a, a job training program along with their education. So we're preparing them for a life after high school. And also college prep. And we're going to push college prep. Not every kid in the system is geared towards going to college. So the ones that don't go to college, when they graduate high school, there'll be something there for them. They'll be trained in something at the end of the day. The idea is the hook of the 11th and 12th grade <coughs> in school so the dropout doesn't happen. That's the key here. That's the, the point of it. And we're also going to get the parents more engaged. We're going to allow the parents to get online so they can track their sons and daughters. We're going to make sure that they get alerts that their sons and daughters don't go to school. Not only right now it's a computer program that calls the house, we're going to do it by computer, by emails to those parents. And they're going to be able to track their progress and see where the kids stand in school on a constant daily basis if they would, if they want to. And this is an important piece because we've lost generation after generation after generation in high school. We want these schools to be state of the art, just like in damn schools. And also Madison Park, there's been a lot of discussion about Madison Park. We're going to start supporting Tom Menino, Mayor Menino's proposal for Madison Park. We're going to make it a full inclusive school when it comes to VOTEC training, similar to a school in Worcester, where the dropout rate is 1.1%. The graduation rates are 90%, 99%. The MCAS passing scoring through the grade levels, anywhere from 74% to higher. They turned it around in five years. If Worcester can do it, we can do it in Boston. And that's what we have to, that's what we're going to shoot for. I also have a plan to do new school construction in the city of Boston. I won't bore you with the details, but we're looking at a, a billion dollars worth of new school construction in a 10 year period. By taking the mills tax, dedicating it to those new schools, taking advantage of the school building authority that the legislature created in 2009. The current mayor proposed a new school, Boston Arts Academy. 
over the Mass Turnpike Authority. They're going to get a, they're looking for a reimbursement from the state. It's a $256 million school to build a new high school. Over the, over the turnpike means the air rights. It's going to cost the city $80 million out of pocket. We might be reimbursed 75% on $256 million. I haven't come up with the money yet. I guess I kind of did tonight. I would ask the school to slow down more because we have a Burke High School that's newly renovated and empty right now. And I, we could do a lot of renovations of a lot of schools in our neighborhood, in our different neighborhoods, by moving off in that one school. It's a needed school, I'm not saying it's not. It does a good job. But I think that we, the, some of the decisions being made right now should be slowed down. So we do have a plan for that, education. We also have a plan for crime, bringing back neighbor, true neighborhood police. What I mean by that is the neighborhood policing was instituted here many years ago. Uh, we didn't really have walking beats, we did in some cases, but we had bicycle beats. And I think it's important to bring those bicycle beats back to neighborhoods. And if a neighborhood is looking for additional police because of something happening, that neighborhood should be paid attention to. You know, there was an incident in South Boston and there was an incident in North End. Twice, two incidents here in North End. We have, we have and so, so, so I'll go right around that. Say, 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 say with me that you're absolutely right. We have, generally the neighborhood is safe. When you have an instance where there's somebody going around attacking women, and in the case of South Boston, somebody going around actually kidnapped a woman and killed her, if the community is looking for additional resources because they're afraid in the safe neighborhood, why fight it? Give the neighborhood the opportunity to get the additional resources it needs to keep the neighborhood safe. And that's what we have to talk about more. You know, in South Boston, a year ago there was a stabbing. A mother got stabbed and killed. You read about it in the newspaper. A guy broke into the house. It's unclear still because it's still in court. The, the elected officials in South Boston were asking for additional drug units in the day because it clearly was a drug unit issue. And they would never give it. Never give it. The commissioner never gave it. A year later, Amy will get killed. At the meeting, at the time in school, I was there. He made an announcement from the, from the podium saying, we're going to give additional drug unit officers to South Boston. A year later, the Amy Lord case was not a drug case. The year before, there was a drug case. That's what I'm talking about. The neighborhood is looking for additional resources. So we're going to talk about that with our police department. We have an opportunity with a new, new commissioner coming in, which I'll be appointing a new commissioner. I'll be appointing a new superintendent of schools. The other piece that I know concerns a lot of folks in this neighborhood is the BRA and economic development. It's important for us in the city of Boston to continue the development and move projects forward. So right now, I've asked the city to slow down on approving projects. I don't mind approving projects. Thank you. I don't mind approving projects that are good projects that have gone through a process. I'm not saying we stop developing the city of Boston because we shouldn't stop developing the city of Boston. What I'm saying is slow down development that hasn't been done <coughs> by the community. That's all I'm asking for. And I, I, that was in the Washington Globe yesterday, and I've asked for that because some of these projects that have been approved have not gone through a community process. We have some ideas. I haven't fully un un unveiled my BRA plan, but it goes something to this effect. I'm going to take the BRA and EDIC merge them together. I'm going to eliminate both boards, create a new board. The board's going to have term limits. The term limits are going to be put out there. People will know what the term limits are. The, the new director of this agency will be a person that runs with a contract. So when the contract is expired, we will look to renew the contract if the person's doing a new job. When the mayor leaves office, that person leaves office with the mayor. So it allows the new mayor to come in, the opportunity to present and do what the new mayor wants to do. We're looking at these urban renewal districts in Boston. We're looking at getting rid of the urban renewal districts and working with the city council to designate new areas of urban, urban renewal. Because what happens right now, 85% of the city of Boston is urban renewal districts. A lot of it gets exempted by zoning. So we're looking to change that. So we need to change that. I think they expire in a couple years anyway, but we're going to do it right now. We're also going to create the new board, as I said. We're going to take EDIC, where all the different pieces of land that are owned by the city, by the BRA, but it's really EDIC, merge it into one agency. So we can take some of the money in EDIC and use it to build some housing, workforce housing, affordable housing in the city of Boston, in places, that, in communities that need it. So people have an opportunity to be able to live in the house where it's not a high-end condominium development necessarily being built in the neighborhood. We're also going to talk about transparency. You all have, you know there's a neighborhood liaison to the North End. That neighborhood liaison for the, for the neighborhood services office has to deal with your complaints and concerns, but also has to deal with development issues. I'm taking that development component away from that person. 
So that person is going to be truly enabled in liaison. We won't have to be worrying about development going on in the neighborhood, pitting that person against the neighborhood, allowing the, the person to be able to do their job. When an idea comes into the BRA, in the new way, when an idea comes into the BRA, they're going to be told to go talk to the community so that the community can have a true process before your 75% plan design done, before you move down the road. And it's about adding transparency. The other side of the coin, it also adds predictability for the developer. It allows the developer the opportunity to come in, present the proposal, and get that proposal done in a timely manner so that they, they, don't, they don't lose out. A lot of times developers, not in every neighborhood, I'm just saying this, because you have to look at both sides and continue building the city. But a lot of times developers will lose a cycle. It'll be 18, 24 months from the time they put their application permit in until it's complete. So we want to have that meeting, that conversation up front. I know my time running for mayor in the city of Boston, and my time before running for mayor, but more so my time running for mayor, the concerns of the folks of the North End being pushed out of your neighborhood. I understand that there are other neighborhoods in the city of Boston that feel the same way. The Fenway area is another prime example. Mission Hill with student housing. And I know you have student housing down here as well. You know, Brighton with student housing. You know, we have a plan to get, and this is going to be part of the, the economic agency, is having the college and universities have campus housing on campus. Have this, your students on campus. And if you don't have the room for your students on campus, I am 100% in favor of doing a proposal, public-private partnership with a private developer to build a building, call it a dorm, run by the school, pay this rent into it, which doesn't happen in the city of Boston right now. We can do that. It's a the ability to do that. What does that do? That creates more supply for housing in our neighborhoods. And hopefully, it will level off some of the cost of neighborhoods. You know, and we also got to create more, more housing. So with the BRA, the, the BRA plan is not complete. It's going to be a new name, new agency, new ideas. Uh, it's going to be unveiled, I believe, next week. I let some of it out the other day, but a lot of things have been happening this week with different campaign, uh, not issues, but different campaign announcements. So we are planning on I'm fully undone that, and it takes away, it takes a lot of the power away from the mayor, shift it over to the IRA, so there's a true agency. And by putting term limits, changing the urban renewal districts, and putting a contract changes the way it's being done today. Um, I'm going to stop talking because I think I've said a lot. Oh, one last thing, um, and I promise you I'll stop talking. One concern that I've heard, well, two concerns I've heard from the North End. One is I have no idea what to do with the book park. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be up front with you. We'll work on that together. <laughs> I'd like to say we'll do more, but we'll do less. Or, or I don't know. <laughs> but I know it's tough because uh, to certainly it's come down to the North End a lot. Um, but the second is cleanliness. You know, there are a couple parts in the city that we have a business district that's a special business district. And what I mean by special, because I know that you're burdened, you have an overburdening of tourism coming to your neighborhoods. But you also have, in, in my opinion, the greatest uh, North End in the country. And I've been to a lot of them. Um, but the city owes respect to the neighborhood to wash down the streets and wash down the sidewalks. So that's one of the things I commit to. I promise you this, in April or March, whenever the weather breaks after my first year, you will see power washes on Hanover Street cleaning down the street. And if you don't, if I if you don't see that, there's a guy in the hallway that will, will bring my neck, Stephen. <laughs> uh, but no, it's it's worth it. I go to other go to other cities. You see that happen. It has to be something given back to the community. It's fine, you know. Well, I'm gonna stop talking. I want to take some questions. If you have any questions? Okay. Yes. Absolutely. First of all, we're we talking about the incidents. There's two incidents going on that happened with one on the other street, the liquor store, the young ones on this side, uh, uh -huh. winery. And um, there were a couple of kids that came in and tried to walk them. There was an indication, and the kid punched the owner in the face and whatnot. And then just the other day, um, it was actually Sunday and or Saturday, and this fellow was coming out of his car because he's getting married and doing whatever the stuff. And these kids, one was up one end, one was down the other end, and tried to rob him. It was, you know, it was a scene. That's, that's one thing. Another thing is also the housing situation. Um, there are a lot of people here in the North End, one reason the North End can't afford where they're living and they don't own their, their, building, their apartments and the are sky high. And I feel like we don't take care of our own, but all the other neighborhoods do, especially from 
one instance, Chinatown has all these um, new buildings for, um, they have a lot more uh, affordable housing for their people and we don't. And um, that's, a, that's yeah. a real... Actually, no, thank you for that. Actually, I was going to say to you last week that they are, they are building one new building in Chinatown now. A lot of Chinatown is another area, believe it or not, that has the same concerns with housing. Um, it, and it's come up time and time again where there's no affordable housing in Chinatown for folks that live there. They're being pushed out of Chinatown. Now, there is housing coming. They're building it now. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's an issue. It's a big issue. And I have a housing plan. Is that one on Harrison Avenue? Uh, no, the one, it's, uh, it's the one that's going to be next to the uh, Mass Street. Washington. <coughs> Washington Street. They're going to build, not Mass Pike, to the on the highway. The ones down on Washington Street, down the end, the high end condominium, right. Haywood Place, <coughs> and the end. And, but I'm talking a little further, the Dainty Dot, is, which is, yeah, Harrison Avenue. Harrison Avenue, yeah. yeah. oh, okay, yeah. That's right. The Whole Foods is going to be there. Yeah. So that's going to be. Um, part, part of that's going to be affordable housing. Oh. But, but for a neighborhood only? Um, well, you can't make it for one name. Yeah, but that's how it usually was. Yeah. And, and um, people here in Manhattan have to get because there's only one more affordable so called housing building here in Manhattan, and that is the Mercantile Loft. And it's a mixture of all different uh, um, price ranges. But, um, <laughs> um, but that's the only place that we have, and there are a lot of people from not from our neighborhood coming into the um, into that when there are other places in other parts of the neighborhood. No, I, I hear what you're saying, and you're absolutely right. There's a lot of neighborhoods in the city that people get pushed out of. Um, South Boston's one, in parts of South East. Uh, North End is a little, little more impacted, I think, than a lot of other neighborhoods. I, I think the two most impacted, in my time being running for mayor, uh, North End and Chinatown are two neighborhoods that are really being pushed because of overdevelopment and the cost of housing. Um, you know, and North End probably more so uh, because of the smaller. Uh, smaller, but you also have your housing stock it is, is, is more one and two. Yeah. Um, so, but we do have a plan on our webpage to talk about affordable housing and how we're going to build it. And one thing I've said is don't be afraid of height. And if we can build something, as we're building some of these other buildings uh, around the, off of the Greenway, if we can possibly look at something for doing some affordable housing there. Um, height, we have to go up because we're losing. We don't have enough money. I mean, our building right now has problems that, um, of piling rot. Yeah. And a lot of the businesses on this um, uh, street floor are having, you know, like they're, but the floors are keeping in. But it is affecting the apartments. And our building, and our, and our apartments, and our building has, has never been um, uh, maintained as far as some of the other properties. Um, Housing properties here in the Boston area, and I'm very familiar with um, parts in Dorchester and South of Boston that have had, like, um, you know, a transformation of whatever fixing up and redoing stuff over our park. And our building has never had that. And this uh, issue. Deterioration of the building. And then the, the rot, the pilings are, are a big situation in Boston. Big time. Yeah. Especially with down our end. And the, the back bay had the same problem with this house. Because what happens is when the pilings are. Kept the you you can do those, but the pilings are uh, the water keeps the pilings safe and healthy. As the water goes down, the pilings dry and splinter. And what you see is the ground side the same thing. So I know it's a big issue. Yes, ma'am. Um, you said don't be afraid of height. Yeah. But I am afraid of height. Um, <laughs> with the building, there, there, there are ten major projects going up just cir in the circle around the north end, um, and the one over TD Garden. Is proposed to be 600 feet high, the highest building here, which is three times this height of the sacrum. It's just architecturally and aesthetically um, crazy, to, in my view, to have um, such a um, something juxtaposed to the sacrum that diminishes it so much. My question is um, there are a lot, of, it seems, a lot of these. Um, projects right now are running to the BRA to get approval before the turnover in the mayor. And can the new mayor reverse any of that if those permissions are given? No. no. Um, not, not, not as far as the BRA design review. The, the one area the new mayor might have some say if it has to go to ZBA for any, any changes. Um, and we will have some project review at the end of it as far as uh, 
uh, the, the first initial <coughs> review is done, and it will go back for design review at some point, so it will be some understanding about design. Uh, but as far as approving these projects, no. The mayor can't go back on us. When I mentioned height, I'm talking about we're going to build affordable housing. I don't mean to put a, you know, a 20-story you know, tower on, on, you know, on this street or on Hanover Street. I'm talking about around the city, some places, if we're looking to put some affordable housing. We often think of affordable housing as a 40-unit building somewhere on a emerging a lot. And I think if we look at doing some real affordable housing, we look at height. That's what I mean by height. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And, but they're not looking at affordable housing. No, uh, no, no, not all affordable. They'd have to be, a, if, if it's housing, I believe there's, there's a housing component to that, um, they'd have to be a 15% affordable. Uh, oftentimes they do it off site, uh, but I'm not sure. I have to look at the particulars in on that one. Sorry. Yeah. Would you continue to have the BRA spend hundreds of thousands of dollars fighting? to erect a restaurant and saloon on Long Wharf Park. The 10 local residents have appealed about. The BRA has spent all this money and years to get this well-connected restaurant and saloon on Long Wharf Park. Would you continue to devote a park to a restaurant and saloon over the objections of the local residents? Um, I don't know enough about it, but it doesn't sound like I would. <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't know if, if, if it's worth it. I'm assuming the city's not building the, the bar or the restaurant. Oh, no, well-connected restaurateur is. And the city's paying for the money to fight for it? They're paying for the money. They're paying to fight it in the courts. Yeah, they I'm not... outside lawyers to fight the tenant. Yeah, I'm not sure if, if I'm going to use... I don't think I'd use city resources to fight a private developer's... Uh, proposal. Um, I think we could use hundreds of thousands of dollars in other places. I would rather fix up a park somewhere, uh, the baseball field, and, and uh, down the street uh, to you know give new inf in infield and new benches and things like that around the park and, and use city money to fight for a private development. So no, the answer is no. I wouldn't continue to do something like that. Yes, sir. the monthly public safety meetings that are run by the area police and officer respectfully speaking on behalf of the North Network Road Neighborhood Council. And as you probably already know, as many people in this room I'm sure are very well aware of, the biggest issues that continuously come up every month at public safety meeting here in North End all relate to quality of life issues, allowed parties, whether it's caused by college students, young professionals, whoever. And not enough police and not a quick enough police response when people, if they choose to do so, do call 911. As the next mayor of Boston, how, what type of plan can you have in place for our neighborhood to be more responsive to resident concerns when certain incidents come up, such as the constant loud parties and what the Let me ask you this question. Do you have, or did you have the party line number? <clears throat> did you ever have that? We had it in Dorchester. I, 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 and when we had the party line dedicated to the police station, it actually worked. We call the party line. Now, sometimes it might be a little late getting there, but it was quicker than calling 911. And then last year they switched it, last summer, they, I believe it was last summer, they switched it to 911. Now it became a 911 call, so the response wasn't as quick. Just so you know what the party line is, it, it's, it's a police department phone number. When you have an incident, you call 911, the police are supposed to show up. In Dorchester and around the city, they, they created a party line where you call the station directly. So if there was a party going on in the neighborhood or something that wasn't, you know, a serious crime, but there was concern around a nuisance, you could call the party line, and oftentimes the, the police would send somebody out to tell to the party. It was low priority, but it was able to be addressed quicker. Last year, this, the commissioners decided to end the party line because it was a money for the cost, and they ended up putting it back on 911, and there was nothing resolved in, in that case. So the first thing is I look at reinstituting the party line. It wasn't perfect, but it was better than not having anything on. Secondly, uh, the one thing that we are, we're, we're at, we're at the minimum, I think we're at the minimum staffing level according to what the police numbers are as far as police officers in the street. If we had the ability to put on more police officers, I certainly would be for it. It's a matter of, I have to go in and see what the budget looks like. Uh, but I certainly am for putting on more police because the more police we can put on, the more opportunity we can have for neighborhood, true neighborhood policing, 
and have the ability to have walking gates and little bicycles. It, you know, I know people want to see the, the police officer walking down the street, but I certainly am not opposed to seeing them going around on a mountain bike because they can travel a lot of the area and go through the community and they'll stumble upon things. And the quality of life that you talked about earlier with the guy getting married and now the car, you just, you just, there's going to be a pop around this time. So I would like to work that way. I can't give the commitment tonight to see what the budget looks like, but I, I certainly would like to do that. I represent George Stenow, so. Yes, sir. Talk more about your plans for City Hall building itself. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, my word wasn't bulldoze City Hall, first of all. Uh, that, was a, that was a different word. Uh, what we're talking about doing City Hall build. There's been several moves by the current mayor to move City Hall and maybe move down to the waterfront and move to different areas. And this proposal that we're having is different than anything that, that's been proposed in the city in the past. What we want to do within the first 90 days of my administration is put out a request for interest on City Hall projects. What does that mean? That means we put out a request for interest to developers in the state, in the city, in the state, in this country, in this world, to come and see if they'd be interested in developing 4.5 acres of land on, in the heart of Boston, to connect City Hall Plaza with the downtown crossing area, and we'd also look at the idea of connecting, moving Hanover Street, connecting Hanover Street to Cambridge Street, bringing it down to grade level. That interest would be whatever somebody would come up with. Maybe it'd be a hotel and an office building, it might be residential, it could be anything, whatever it is. But if we get a developer interested in it, what we would do, we'd look to sell City Hall Plaza roughly for about 125 to $150 million the cost of whatever. 4.5 acre piece of land in Boston would be. If we had interest and we were in the process of doing that, we'd put out a request for proposal to a private developer to either build a new building for us in the downtown crossing area or in the financial district area. I believe it belongs in downtown, yeah. not in the seaport, and not in the waterfront. And also look at doing a private development where somebody would build as a city hall. We would then lease the building back. We let them build it. They build it. No tax breaks, no tax incentives, no special deals. Build it. City Hall would, would lease back the building from them. And the period of lease would be anywhere from 20 to 40 years. At the end of the lease, the owner would turn the keys over to us. It would be our building. We'd put two, keep two, piece, two pieces of property on the tax rolls. The City Hall Plaza would bring in roughly between 10 and $12 million a year into the economy as far as taxes, real estate taxes. And we'd also be paying taxes on the building we're leasing. All the services that are currently existing in City Hall would move over. The security would move, there's some concern, the security would move over, the maintenance would move over, would maintain the building, we're just leasing the building back. And allows us the opportunity to do some development in the heart of our city, away from the neighborhood. Because a lot of people, people are saying, where's the next growth area in the city of Boston? I personally think the next growth area in the city of Boston is the downtown crossing area. When I was a kid, I would go to downtown crossing my mom, Hop on the train to JFK, we'd get off of Washington Street, we'd go to Jordan's and Finance. And that's where we did all our shopping. And, all, and it was bustling back then. Gilchrist. And Gilchrist was there, and Woolworths was there. And we, and, and, you know, but we've lost, that, we've lost that in downtown. We've lost that ability. We have a lot of opportunity to bring people downtown. We have two or three stations there. And it, it connects to the city. And not that, and the other idea was looking, do we renovate City Hall? It's nearly impossible for us to renovate at a cost, cost effectiveness because there's a hole in the middle of City Hall. It's built with concrete. There's very little you can do inside of the building. It's, 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 it's just something I think it makes all the world of sense. The money we received from the sale of City Hall, we would put it into early, fully funding early childhood education. Fourth graders, fourth, four year olds getting K-1 services. We would put some of that money into the art program. We put a lot, some of that money into programs about fixing our park system in Boston. So our park system is brought up to speed, and we would take some of that money and put it into the rainy day fund, the reserve fund, for, for it so we have money for rainy day. That's the idea. It doesn't move forward if there's no interest. If there's no interest, then we have to come up with an idea what to do with City Hall. I think if you put it out there, I think you'll get a lot of uh, people. We could, we could. Because also you have Faneuil Hall on the backside that, that goes up against the wall. So we'll bring everything kind of open up that, that area. I think it would be good for the city of Boston. How could it open up if you're going to make a high-rise building there? No, you open up the space. They're not going to make a high-rise building on the 4.5 acres. They're going to put, they'll put, they'll put buildings on the spot. They'll be able to develop on the land on the 4.5 acres. But it's not all high-rises. It's going to be an open space. There'll be corridors and 
well, there's a tunnel cap there as well, so we could build in there that there's going to be green space on the tunnel cap because they can't build on the whole site because the train goes underneath. So they're limited by some as far as how they can build. Yes, ma'am. I'm glad to hear you mention open space. Um, I've been going to a number of meetings about the um, center proposal at the Haymarket uh, T station and garage and uh, the North Station garden proposal. Yeah. And I've attended some of the meetings over the years, and I know that the buildings that are being built on some of the Greenway parcels are building right out to the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. I feel that there hasn't been enough planning in terms of infrastructure um, for all these proposals that are being brought to us that are going to add residents as well as office workers. We keep hearing about not having so much parking with these new developments because people are going to use public transportation. And yet the people who live here already know that especially during peak commuting times, the T can't handle the passenger load that it has now. It's already maxed out for its capacity during uh, rush hours. So adding more people to that mix isn't going to help anything. And we also know that the, uh, the bridge to Charlestown needs repair. So we're hearing about all these development projects coming in. There hasn't been the planning and the, the buildup of the infrastructure that I really think is needed. And I'm concerned that we have development projects being brought to us that add not one square foot of open space, but they're talking about adding residents. The North End already has a, a less than ideal amount of open space for the number of residents that are here. So now you're talking about adding a lot more people to the area. We don't have what is needed to make it a, a community. We don't have enough open space. People have been lobbying for 15 or 20 years now for a grocery store. And I have to say that the idea that the preferred site for a North End grocery store is over at North Station at the Garden, not my idea of, of a local grocery store, especially for a lot of uh, our senior citizens who have spent their whole lives here and we want to keep them here. So I'd like to hear more about them. Planning. I mean, planning, planning is, is, is a key part to our city. Um, 20 years ago, there was a planning process for the waterfront. And it was going to be a great type of space, and there was all kinds of buildings that we put down there. And the height, if you're familiar with South Boston, uh, towards the community end, there was a lot of two and three family houses. And what they were going to do is, as, as, they, as you left the neighborhood heading towards the waterfront, it was going to go, go up in height. And then as you got to the kind of the middle of the seaport, it was supposed to go back down and height as you got to the water. Uh, and if anyone has driven down to the seaport, uh, you clearly see that they, that plan is not in effect today. And if you live in South Boston, a lot of the development that's on along First Street is a wall. You see big, long buildings. So there was a planning process, and, and the planning wasn't followed. And I think the key here is that if there's a planning process and there's a neighborhood involvement, it's really up to the administration to follow what the planning process is. And it's really going to be, the burden's going to be on me to make sure as the community plans what the future of the neighborhood looks like, that, that I institute and make sure we stay on, on mark as far as what the community wants. So that, that's kind of one of the things that we have to look at. What's happening in Boston, I think, in some cases, it's growth, but it's growth at all costs in certain neighborhoods. And I think we have to be a little more careful of that. Um, as far as open space goes, I, I, I'm familiar with some of the ideas around the government center garage and, I'm, and, and North Station, the, where the Boston Garden is. Um, I'm familiar with some of that development. I mean, obviously, it's been a new paper. And Causeway Street and all those different streets have been developed and developing fairly quickly right now. And I also know there's a concern in, in the North End as far as, as far as the supermarket. And I know that the proposal that the garden has a supermarket in it, but I think there was also another proposal. Trinity was get approved for a proposal. I'm not sure the site There was supposed to be a supermarket in that as well. No, Trinity did. I thought they did. No, they were forced to do it. They didn't want it. I, I believe the space is being held for up to 18 months, and then they're off the hook if they can't find somebody, or if locally another development puts a grocery store in. I yeah, I think that's the one. Right. But I think that, you know, they, they, I, don't even, they, I don't know if they want, I don't know if they wanted one in their initial development, and they were forced by the BR to put one in. And I think the issue might be Whole Foods. If they had to, like, stop and shop or something. Rose Brothers or something. Yeah, Rose Brothers. And Rose Brothers is a great supermarket. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, I was there 
come from all places. The West Roxbury one, incredible. Oh my God, it's incredible. <laughs> it is, it really is. It's a great place. It's, all, it's family owned, that's why. It's like a small neighborhood bank. Any other questions? Or well, suggestions? Yes? Can you come to that way you can help? No. <laughs> no I absolutely love to. Yes. We'll, after this, we'll grab, we'll grab uh, Brandon. I want, I want to go back. Actually, I was the, we have 200 miles in the back of the you know. But we'll have one to focus it on the back of the you We have the arts. We have the arts and arts. Yeah, LGBTQ. No, absolutely, I'd love to. I think actually we might have back at being home. It's got to be much. But we'll, we'll, we'll get it. You mentioned Yeah. 
I, I mean, I, I think if the community wanted that, I wouldn't be opposed to it. We just have to make sure the residents get the traffic around, because what will happen now, the residents that, that use that, other, other streets are going to pick up the extra traffic. Because people are going to come to the North End, and they're going to find a way to get in. And then, you know, they generally will, won't park kind of garage and walk over. They'll try and drive and get that spot that's your spot in front of your house, and then get whacked with a $55 ticket. Not that I don't have that, but just. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Yeah, what is I wanted to ask you a question about park funding, which you alluded to when we were talking about City Hall Plaza. Uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge you were kind enough to come and visit Christopher Columbus Park. I'm a, a member of the board of the Friends Group of Christopher Columbus Park. And during the mayor's breakfast, you came and hung out with us for a while and talked about park issues. It was nice to have that exchange. Um, one of the things that we do as the Friends Group is we raise a lot of money to do a lot of things that the city can't do. Uh, uh, the trellis lighting. Um, a lot of the trees that get knocked down, the replacement, we fund. But we sort of get the feeling that for every dollar, and we, we, we do lots of fundraising events. We have one actually happening in this room in, in, uh, next month. Um, but you know, if we, if we do fundraising for $100,000, we get the feeling that the city backs off at least $100,000 in um, the, the expenditures on the park. I know that the Parks Department is trying to do a lot with, uh, they have a lot of parks and they don't have a whole lot of money at this point, but one of the things that I want to suggest is that maybe there are some better interfaces that, uh, uh, that can be created between the Parks Department, whatever funding they have, and some of these friends groups. Because one example that we're looking at is the trellis lighting, which we're on a major capital to, to raise $100,000 for totally new lights for the trellis, we need to replace them. But we're going to need to plug them into a core electrical system that hasn't been updated by the, by the Parks Department since it was put in in 1978. It's the original system. It's like, if you look at it, you can tell it's the original system. And I just want to find out, uh, short of a major real estate deal that's a great success for City Hall Plaza that funds everything, what would your administration do to help the park situation? I mean, the first thing we have to do is do an assessment of what we have. I mean, we, in bad budgets, the parks get decimated. And I can speak the same for DCR parks. Uh, we just get, they get, they get decimated in the budget. Uh, because you usually cut out the non-program services first uh, before you start going into the service. Uh, you know, when you look at the school department, the, the school department has 8,000 employees to the Boston Public School Department. The, Public Works Department, I believe the, the budget, the, the employees about 379 people. So you're talking about 47 acres, 47 miles of, of land in Boston that we have 300 people covering. You know, and I don't know what the numbers are for the uh, Parks and Rec, but it, Parks and Rec is something that's real important to me. Uh, I'm a former, I, I ran a Little League, former Little League coach. Um, some people don't get to that. Um, you know, and, and I find it important for, for kids to have that, that outlet, a safe outlet. I also find it important for, I, I represent Dorchester, and the area that I have is South, I have part of Savin Hill. So we have a nice park down the end, McConnell, that needs a renovation. We also have the beach, we boardwalk around the beach there inside Dorchester Bay, which is state. So, you know, and, and oftentimes if, if you put a little effort into them, a little money into them, you can keep them up to grade. So what I want to do is do a full assessment of what the park system is, and I would like to have more partnerships, you know, with different businesses to upgrade the park. I don't know how people feel on this, but if a company wants to put their name on a fence and give us money, let them put their name on the fence. It really doesn't affect me if, you know, Liberty Mutual wants to say, maybe it's the wrong word, but Liberty Mutual donated $100,000 a year to this park. If they want to put a little plaque on a fence, I'm fine with that. And I think that we, we should look at a little bit of that more as far as benefiting more from that. I'm not saying if you know, like, they, like Fenway Park, that you know, you'd be Mason. You know, like, <laughs> but if you have something, there's no problem, I have no problem with that. And I think we can build more of those relationships to, to, in different parks around, around the city. As far as the infrastructure of the parks, um, again, I can't comment on it, it's on there. But, you know, they, they deal with old trucks, a lot of them are old trucks. But the park, the Columbus Park is beautiful. And, and, and a lot of parks are beautiful. And your friends group is outstanding. And, you know, I, I'm not saying this because I'm standing in the North End, but the friends of the North End, uh, the friends of Franklin Park, um, there's a friends group in um, Charlestown, I want to say, 
the best ones in the city. And I've been to a whole city. And there's a lot of park space in Boston that could use a good friends group. You know, and it's kind of like a school. Like the schools, they start with the schools. When you have a good, strong parent group, the schools seem to be successful. When you don't have a good, strong parent group, schools are kind of struggling. So the same with the parks. It's kind of a mindset. So we have to try and build up some of those friends groups too around the, around the city. Yes, sir. As mayor, do you it would be possible to provide the residents, not just the North End or nearby areas, but all cities, or all members in the city, with an outlet to at least have some sort of say as to what type of um, units go into these new buildings? And my concern is that all of us have been aware of a lot of buildings on the waterfront that are zoned for office use that are yeah. vacant. My concern is building new buildings in the North End that are zoned for office use. And we all know the economy is bad. Having empty office space just existing near the North End. It's one thing to have it in the waterfront, which is generally a business area. Does it have, but I fear just that something like that happening near the North End. Is there anything that can? Well, one thing that, that I've been talking about is an office of business development. And I've been saying for a couple of months that the BRA doesn't have one, but I was informed they do have one. So now that I know they have one, I have no idea what they do. <laughs> um, and what I mean by that is going out and attracting businesses to come to the office space in Boston. Team, teaming up our venture capitalist companies in Boston that do about $2 billion a year in venture capitalist money to incubate companies. And actually keeping those companies in Boston rather than having those companies take the money from Boston and go to Cambridge and some of them. Um, Trying to find businesses that go in empty spaces. One quick story, Dorchester Avenue, uh, and that's what I know from being in. Uh, construction company had 70 employees they were in the St. Mark section of Dorchester Avenue, and they wanted to stay in Boston because they were growing their company. But they had no, they went to the city, but they had no, no, nobody teamed them up with a location. So we lost a company to Quincy of 70 employees that now is like 120 employees, and the spot they left sat vacant for about seven years. So I want an office with somebody who's a business company, a business in this, in this city, saying, I have a company, we're growing out of our space, we want to find a new space. And, and team them up with different neighbors so we can keep that business in Boston, as well as bringing in some businesses into these office buildings in downtown. You know, and I, I, I guess that was funny, anywhere to the BRA, I apologize, but, um, you know, we, we need to do more of that. You know, you have a real estate, you have a real estate down in North End, you say, I'm looking for a two bedroom, and this is my price range, we're really going to try and find a few. We should have the same thing in Boston. We have a 10 floors on a building in downtown Crossing, and this is what we want for rent, and find something for us. So we should be working that way. And I think that a lot of times that doesn't happen. So what happens is people decide to convert, it's not in downtown Boston, but convert to condominiums. We've only got time for one more, because we promised nine, and we're lying a little bit, because we're over. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me what just say, do you about the motorcycle noise? Enforce the law, or just forget it like a like I don't know. Has I mean, I'm, we're going to try and enforce it. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that um, you know, noise, noise, noise in general, low riding cars and everything else. Um, we will try. We'll enforce it the best we can. I mean, I know what you're saying. There's people coming down. I think I know what you're saying. <laughs> exactly where you need to go. The revving and the pulling out and stuff. Um, there's yeah, also. Well, we also have an issue with uh, in Boston. You saw the New York case where the guy is getting hit by the car. That's going on in Boston. I saw it. Well, not I mean we're not running people over, but I saw a situation like that all, twice over the weekend. People driving around Boston, uh, 30, 40 motorcycles zipping around. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's, it's well, it is threatening, and it's you know, I, I get very and there's probably motorcycles in the room, but I just couldn't do it. Nervous, but we we will any any type of quality of life stuff. It's about enforcement. It's about asking police officers. I'll tell you right now, another one, walk the box. People are going to be mad at me. Walk the box is when somebody drives into an intersection, when the lights turn in yellow and they're stuck in the intersection. It's a $500 ticket. I'm going to start telling cops to enforce the $500 ticket. Roll. So no gridlock. Because it's right, no gridlock. You know, and that, they do it in New York and they get rid of the problem. You know, so that's, that's a matter of the kind of writing a ticket. That's big time. Revenue from the city. It's great, but it's fine. <laughs>
I think it's right now, so we still have Omega 500 on. We know a lot of good stuff with that. For the cyber signal yeah. country, it's known as the Silicon Valley of the East. Um, obviously, there's a, you want to preserve the historical integrity of the city, but there's got to be a way where the city being the Silicon Valley of the East, being a technology city, that we incorporate technology into government, into schools, into things like that, that can kind of propel the city into a bigger role. I'm glad you brought that up. One, one thing that we're going to look at doing, too, is, is our online services in the city of Boston. We're going to upgrade our computer technology. Uh, if you have a bill to pay, you're going to be able to pay it online. You won't have to go in town. I think right now, if I'm not mistaken, in real estate taxes, you pay it Monday through Thursday. You, you pay it Monday and Tuesday, you can't pay it Wednesday because it's closed. You pay it Thursday, Friday. You're going to be able to go online and actually pay it if you want to. Uh, and we're also going to try and change technology where you're going to get a lot more inputs and data information. We're going to talk to the police about, and if you use a phone, I think almost everyone uses a cell phone, smartphone technology, we're going to be talking about that in the city of Boston. If there's an alert around the city, you're going to get something on your phone. If there's something going on, you're going to get an email from the city. We're going to bring the city up into the, truly up into the 21st century. And one last thing I'll just say, unrelated but sort of related, is I had a meeting uh, yesterday, two days ago, with the Biotech, Bio, Mass Bio Council. And we talked about bringing in more biotech companies into Boston. And not, not necessarily just um, pharmaceutical companies, looking at manufacturing companies that actually make manufacturing devices where people that have a high school diploma can actually get, can get a job and earn a decent wage for them and their family and bring some of those companies. We do very little in that industry right now. In, in my conversation with the council yesterday, uh, you know, the mayor, the mayor does do some stuff there. He said, but there's so much more we can do, so much more proactively. Other cities in this state take advantage of it in a big time way. We don't. I plan on doing that and bringing some of this technology, these companies, to underperforming neighborhoods uh, so that people in those neighborhoods get a chance to have employment and help bring their life up. I mean, that's an important piece to do. To to but let me just say this. I want to thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, the election is four weeks from tomorrow. I would ask you to please go on my webpage, MartyWalsh.org, and, and look at some of my policy. That's if you're not voting for me or haven't considered voting for me. Uh, if you voted for somebody else in the primary, I want to thank you for coming tonight. Uh, and I want to thank you for, for listening and thank you for going out and voting. Uh, it's important that we have more people go out to vote. Uh, and I will be here for a little bit. Uh, I have been down in North End the entire campaign, and I'll be down in North End for the next four weeks where you'll see me in the street. And you can get me from my webpage. If you want to sign up, I believe we have some sign up sheets out the back here for if you want to sign up for the campaign. And socks, see now, you have plenty of time. <laughs> three to three, brand new ball game, end of sixth. So we get one from the top of the seven. <laughs> Thank you.